Hello. This is a instructional course that my friend Eric Krauss and I give at the Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, uh, usually once a year. So um, we're going to talk about the art of medicine and why it's lost. So what is the art of medicine? It means placing the patient's interest above all others. It means keeping the patient fully informed, answering their questions, allaying their fears, creating a friend, giving the patient your time and attention, touch, time management. Now, so what do we mean by placing the patient's interest above all others? If you always do what's in the best interest of the patient, you never have to worry about your ethics, okay? The patient's interest must come above all others. Yours, the insurance company, the hospital, or the surgery center, particularly if you own an interest in the surgery center. Keeping the patient fully informed, okay? You've got to explain all diagnostic studies and the side effects, and you've got to use simple language. Most of the time, you're not talking to a rocket scientist. So you've got to talk about the surgical procedures, you've got to talk about all studies that you do, and time management is very important. So few doctors really understand time management, and they don't do a very good job of managing their time. So there are all different kind of ways to save time and yet inform your patient. And so one of the things that I did in my practice was I sat in front of a camera, very much like this, and I had some charts. And I would go through every single operation that I did, and I would talk about the procedure itself, what the risk and complications were, and all the tried to answer before the patient asked me all the things that I could possibly think of that they would need. I had a 35-minute lecture on Meniere's disease. There was no way in my busy afternoon practice of seeing patients that I could spend 35 minutes with a patient. I would. I had a small theater in my office so that the patient and their family could go in and watch this tape. And it would explain everything about Meniere's disease to them. Then I would see them, and I would say, do you have any questions about what you saw on that tape? And they'd say, no, I understand it very well. And if I was going to do surgery, I'd even have them sign a statement like that in my chart. So you've got to talk about complications, and we'll, we'll go over that in a minute, but it's extremely important that the patient understands exactly what they're getting into. And you've got to be upfront about fees and other charges. Now, even, even though uh, insurance covers most of what we do nowadays in surgery, um, there's still other charges that come up that the patient may not know about got to answer the questions. So if you use a TV or a, D, a DVD, as well as brochures, that will decrease the number of questions. Now, when you talk to a patient about the surgery, anything, uh, you've got to sit down to talk to them. Uh, that puts them on the same level as uh, they are. It puts them at ease and it lets them know you're not just gonna to talk to them and run out the room. So it's very important to sit down. You've got to listen, you've got to be honest, and you've got to be realistic. You cannot, under any circumstance, paint a rosy picture on something and make the patient think that it's just you know, uh, a piece of cake that they're going into. Because a lot of times they're going into a life-threatening surgical procedure, and they need to know the facts. Now, in general, 
people don't sue their friends. Yeah, it occasionally happens, but most of the time it doesn't. So you've got to build a relationship with the patient based on honesty and the patient's best interest. Very important. And patients know when they're being misled. They know when you're fudging or you're you know, cutting corners. So that's called the doctor-patient relationship. That's this friendship that you develop with your patient. Now, I, I really believe that all doctors and nurses should have a very serious illness early in their career. And the reason I say that is, unless you've been at the mercy of the medical system, you don't really know what it's like. I am fortunate or unfortunate to have had um, several surgeries. I've had two uh, fractured pelvises. I had a fractured pelvis in Los Angeles when I was at the house here clinic. And uh, my room was right next to the nurse's station on the floor of the hospital where we put all of our patients. And I would turn on my uh, call button and I wouldn't get any kind of a response. I happened to know the number of the telephone at the nurse's station. So if I called them on the telephone, I could get their attention and they would come take care of whatever I needed. That is not practicing good medicine and it's not the way to, for nurses to treat anybody. I don't care if you're a doctor or a ditch digger. Patients diverge better than that. Now patients are frightened when they go to see the doctor, particularly if they think there's something really bad wrong with them. And I told all of the people that work for me, I said, look, patients that come in here, they're scared, they don't know what's wrong with them, they don't feel good, don't ever get in an argument with them. You know, just treat them like gold because they're the ones that pay your salary. I write the check, but they're the ones that pay your salary. So, you know, they're scared, they don't feel well, you've got to treat them well. And most of them have no idea what lies ahead of them. Now, you've got to give the patient your time and attention. And this is where time management comes in. It's extremely important in running a successful practice. My example is this. You have a patient, say you've got an acoustic tumor patient in the hospital. You go in each morning, you stand at the foot of the bed, and you have their chart, you look at it, make sure the temperature is okay, et cetera, blood pressure, all of that. And you, you say, um, how are you feeling? Uh, do you have any problems, any questions this morning? Uh, anything we need to do for you? Well, you know, if you've prepared them correctly, they don't have any questions, and they say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, then you leave. That takes maybe five minutes maximum. Now, the difference is, though, on the day of discharge, you don't just walk in and stand at the, at the foot of the bed. You pull up a chair and you sit down, and you say, I will sit here as long as it takes to answer all your questions. Well, if you prepared them correctly, they don't have any questions. They may want to say, well, when should I come back or something like that. But the fact that you sat down and said that lets them understand that you're not going to just rush out of the room and leave them with a bunch of questions in their head. So that one act of just simply sitting down and saying, I'll stay here until I answer all your questions puts them totally at ease and then you get up and walk out, and again, it's less, you know, less than five, five minutes. But that's time management, and that's keeping the patient informed. Now, this is very important. When you have a, anybody, any surgeon that gets up and gives a talk and presents something and says he never has a complication, is either number one, lying, or number two, he doesn't do surgery. Okay? We all have complications. There's not a doctor or surgeon that ever did an operation that hasn't had a complication. Now, when you do have a complication, there's a tendency, even though you know that it's not your fault, 
you still have a tendency to blame yourself. And so, you know, when there's something unpleasant you don't want to deal with, you kind of want to push it aside and stay away. So there's a tendency, if you have a complication, not to want to see the patient. And that's the very worst thing that you can do. If you normally make rounds once a day or twice a day, you need to make rounds five times a day, six times a day. Go at lunch, uh, go in the mid-afternoon during office hours, go at night before you go home. You've got to let the patient know that you're concerned. And, you know, it's all right to say that you're sorry that they had the complication. So you sit down, you talk to the patient, you say, I'm really sorry you had this complication. We talked about it beforehand. We knew it could occur. Um, we've dealt with these kinds of things before, and we'll help you get through it. But you've got to see the patient numerous times. If you don't do that, the family and the patient think you don't care, and that is the one thing you do not want to happen. You want the family and the patient to know that you care a great deal about them and how they're doing. Now, time is your most valuable asset. You are in complete control of your time. You should use it wisely. Time is money. Okay. Time management is important because it dictates how much time you spend with your family, how much time you have for other interests, how your patient sees you, how your staff sees you, how your associates see you, how you perceive your own self-image. So this is how it works. When you dictate a referral letter, you know, a lot of people just sit down and they do it from scratch. Well, you know, nowadays with computers, you can write a, a sort of a standard uh, referral letter and you just insert things that um, apply to that particular person. Operative notes. I've seen doctors spend 30 minutes uh, dictating an operation. Uh, when I was dictating, for instance, like a stay piece procedure. Stay piece procedure is done almost exactly the same way every time you do it. The only thing that varies is that there's something really unusual about the case, the stay piece. Most of the time, the only thing that's different is the size and the length of the prosthesis. So what I did for all the operations that I did, I did a standard dictation and then I gave it to the dictating pool in the hospital, and I said, when I say this is a stay piece procedure, you will be able to go to this pre-dictated stay piece procedure, and I will tell you uh, what to insert. And so I'd pick up the phone and say, this is a standard stay piece procedure. I used a 4.5 house wire over fascia. That was it. That took probably 20 seconds. If I did the same thing over and over and over again, it would take a good 10 to 15 minutes. So um, in the doctor's lounge, I would occasionally see a doctor spend you know, a long time describing something that could be done very quickly. In most hospitals, the surgeon's lounge, the doctors sit around between cases. It's usually 45 minutes to an hour between cases. And they'll sit and talk about hunting and fishing and uh, you know football games and things like that. I had an office, a one-room office in the hospital. And as soon as I dictated the um, operation, I went to my hospital, I mean, up in the hospital office, and I did dictation. I uh, you know, did all kind of things during that hour that was very productive. Then I'd go back down into the operating suite so you have to manage your time. You know, have your prescriptions pre-typed uh, out so that uh, all you have to do is sign them and have your nurse uh, put in the uh, patient's name. Um, pre- and post-operative orders should always be typed up before. Um, you know, you just fill in the drugs or whatever you want done special. 
but you don't write out orders time and time again. History and physical, get a medical student to do those for you. Uh, discharge summaries, you know, if you don't have a PA, hire a, an RN. Have her do those, then you sign them. Um, explaining surgical procedures, we've already talked about that. You have a DVD. Explaining uh, diagnostic studies, the same thing. Making hospital rounds, we've talked about that. Dealing with surgical complications, we've talked about that. Seeing patients, okay. You see patient, you know, normally a, a, a notologic surgeon does um, surgery in the morning, sees patients in the afternoon. So you, um, you work it so that you see the patients very quickly. Now, this is a favorite one for me because when I was in practice, I had a younger associate and he came to me one day and he was really excited. He said, the hospitals asked me to take over such and such uh, committee. And I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take the job. I said, that, that's great. I got to ask that. And I said, well, what are they going to pay you? He said, well, they're not going to pay me anything. Well, why would you work for the hospital for free? That takes up your time. You could be doing something more productive. You could be writing a paper, um, going to a movie, doing anything. Why, why work for free? They don't give you anything. Why give them anything? You bring them money. You bring them, you know, a lot of money every year, the patients that you bring in. I never, never go on a committee for the hospital unless they threaten to throw me off the staff, and then I'm going to argue with them, okay? Because I don't do anything for free. Okay, dealing with third-party payers. This is a bad one. You know, I did an audit on my practice once of insurance companies, and some of them were waiting 10 months to pay me for something that I did. So, you know, I got a great story about when they first started doing um, free certification, and I did, a, I did a lot of acoustic tumors, and I like to put them in the night before surgery because I didn't think it was right to have somebody get up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, rush into the hospital facing a life-threatening uh, operation. They might die. They need a good night's sleep before. So I insisted that the patients go in the night before. And uh, this is early on when they started this process. But I told the patients, look, you need to be in the hospital the night before surgery. If the insurance company won't pay for it, you need to pay for it. It's the only way I'm going to do the surgery. You, you have to be in the night before surgery. So I had this lady I was going to put in the night before surgery, and my insurance lady came to me and said, Dr. Glasscock, I cannot get this patient in the hospital. They just won't let me put her in. I said, well, are you dealing with a secretary, a, a doctor, a nurse? And she said, well, I don't know, but I, I think it might be a secretary. I said, well, go back and tell her the reason we're putting the patient in the hospital is because she's sick. Now, I'd like somebody to find for me what sick means because the lady, the minute my insurance person said the patient's sick, the woman on the other side of the telephone conversation, well, of course, if she's sick, you've got to put her in the hospital. So she got in the hospital. The insurance company paid for it. But I think it's inhumane to ask a patient that's facing a life-threatening operation to get up in the middle of the night and rush into the hospital. That's not good medicine. So you've got to duplicate yourself in order to have good time management. That means you've got to dictate and dilate, I'm sorry, you've got to delegate and duplicate yourself. But since you're ultimately responsible, you've got to always circle right around and make sure that it was done. You've got to use automation. Nowadays with computers, it's so much easier than it used to be. And you need to adopt electronic records. Nobody wants to do that because of the cost, but it's very, very uh, important. And you can integrate 
audiograms, um, lab studies, medical imaging, everything into electronic records. Now, I often hear doctors complain about their schedule. I say the front desk overbooks them. Well, who do those people at the front desk work for? They work for the doctor. The doctor is in charge of his time. So he needs to tell them how many patients he wants to see in an afternoon. If it's an emergency, then of course you have to add somebody in. But most doctors just say, I'll take everybody that shows up. Well, you can't do that. Now, what do people do when they first meet a stranger? They shake hands. So touch is a very important part of human contact. So you need to touch your patients respectively. You know, you just tap them on the shoulder, uh, tap them on the knee, whatever, when you're talking to them and exam them, but it's, it's very important. You know, chiropractors have absolutely zero science behind them, absolutely zero. Nothing they do is medically based. They're basically masseurs. But if you talk to any patient that's been to see a chiropractor, they love their chiropractor. They may hate their doctor, their physician, but they love their chiropractor. The reason they love their chiropractor is that he touches them. He rubs their back. He pulls their shoulder out of joint, whatever he does. But it's touch. It's very, very important. So why is the art of medicine important? The patient will have confidence in your ability, will trust you, will not sue you, will have a positive attitude going into the surgery, will accept a serious complication, will get well quicker, and will fight the insurance company in your behalf. I, I remember operating on a woman who was 65. I took a, a um, glomus tympanicum tumor out of her. I charged my regular fee. Medicare paid like uh, a fifth of it. And it really made her mad. She was a Republican, as I remember. And she got uh, both senators and her congressmen all over Medicare, and they ended up paying me uh, a, a little bit more than they would have uh, otherwise. So, we all go, when we go to medical school, our professors, the first thing they say is, listen to the patient, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. Very important. Now, when you're listening to a patient, you know, doctors like to think in linear terms. And so you ask a patient, when, when did this problem start to bother you? Well, you know, if you're from Middle Tennessee, they're going to say, well, it happened when my uh, cow went dry. And, uh, and then they go on something about why the cow went dry, et cetera. Well, you know, for a busy surgeon sitting there, <laughs> he has no idea when the cow went dry. So you've got to try to keep the patient focused. And they've done some studies on their interruption. And so 1984, they did a study. 77% of the doctors interrupted the patient in the first 17 seconds. In other words, the patient started explaining what was wrong with them, and the doctor would interrupt them and say, well, now, wait a minute, what, what was so and so and so and so? They didn't give the patient time to finish their sentence. Well, in 1999, they did another study, and 72% interrupted within 23 seconds. So you're not going to get a good valid history if you don't listen to the patient. Now, there are polite ways to move them along, but uh, you need to wait at least a minute before you interrupt them. Just listen to them. Let them get started on their story. Now, I live in Austin, Texas now. It's a very laid back community. And when I go to see the doctor, he's uh, usually in church late, no tie, and they're very informal. So, you know, in Tennessee, when I was in practice, I always wore a, a long white coat, a tie. And it's always been my opinion that if you look like a doctor, you're patient will thank your doctor. If you look like a golf pro, they might have a question. So, you know, it's important to um, be pleasant, smile, uh, 
be very reassuring, be sincere, and always control your temper. You never want to get mad at a patient. I mean, they, they may do something that really makes you mad, but you just simply cannot do that. So, communicating and counseling. Communication means different things. Medical communications mean different than legal communication. So when you say the word competent, that means one thing medically, another thing legally. You've got to use understandable plain English. So you want to find out what's wrong, uh, what can and cannot be done for the patient, what are the um, procedures involved, et cetera, et cetera. It's all written there. Always invite questions at the end of every encounter. As you sit down, you talk to a patient. Before you get up to leave, you ask, do you have any questions? Now, they've done some interesting studies. If you are very careful to explain to a patient exactly everything that's going to happen to them, in one week, they've retained 40% of everything you said. If you give written materials along with it, like a brochure explaining what happened, it goes up to 50%. So no matter how hard you work, the patient is still only going to remember about half of what you said. So you have to keep repeating everything to them all the time that you're seeing them. Okay. Very rarely do physicians get sued if they listen and they say, I will always answer your questions. It's all right to use humor as long as it's in good taste. Always ask your patients what their opinion is. Um, make sure they understand. Encourage patients to talk. Um, remain appropriate and smile. Okay, now, the telephone can be your friend. Always be the caller, not the callee. So, if you've operated on something, they've gone home, either you should do it or your nurse should do it, you should call them at home and say, you know, um, this is your first day um, out of the hospital, just checking in to see how you're feeling, if you're having any problems, anything we need to do for you. And um, that, you know, makes them feel um, really important that you took the time to call them, or at least your nurse took the time to call them. And uh, even if you leave a voicemail, you just say, I'm sorry I couldn't talk to you in person, but I was just calling to check on you and see how you're doing. If you have any questions or you're having a problem, please call the office. Now, if you want to get a lawsuit served against you, there are uh, 10 things that will absolutely guarantee that you will get sued. And these are, don't keep detailed records, okay? Don't document informed consent discussions. Fix records after something has gone wrong. Like, you know, patient wakes up um, with a complication, um, you forgot to note it, you go back after you've been sued, change the record, I noticed this morning the patient had a patient paralysis. That's, that's not good. Uh, you cannot trust a patient to follow up uh, on a referral. You may tell them to go see a doctor, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do it. Don't check the chart when ordering medication. Okay, that'll get you sued. Don't say anything if someone, uh, something goes wrong. Okay, something goes wrong, you got to talk about it. Cannot diagnose over the telephone. You've got to care whether the patient likes you. If you don't care, you're going to get sued. Assume that each patient needs just a few minutes, okay? And don't track test results. I'm going to tell you a story about tracking test results. Okay, Larry McNeil was a patent attorney. And his family doctor was Art Green. He uh, had an episode of um, he, he couldn't start his stream. 
when he wanted to urinate. And so he went to the emergency room and he saw the urologist on call. Um, the urologist told him that he had an enlarged prostate and at some point he would need um, to have a surgical procedure to reduce the mass of the prostate. Well, um, the urologist decided to get a chest x-ray on him uh, in the emergency room. And um, so the radiologist saw the chest x-ray and dictated um, the fact that there was a small lesion in the upper lobe of the right lung. Well, that report was put into uh, the hospital chart of Larry McNeil. The people at the hospital in medical records sent that report to Ed Green, not Art Green, Ed Green, who was an internist. And um, he had a patient named Larry McNeil, except it was N-E-A-L instead of N-E-I-L, okay? So that was lost, basically. The patient goes on for about 18 months and develops far advanced carcinoma of the lung. That resulted in a $2 million settlement. This was several years ago. So what does that tell you? You've got to follow up and you make, got to make sure what's going on. And so, you know, the urologist wasn't on top of it. Ed Green had never seen the patient. It's just a mess up, a terrible mess up. But it cost this man his life. If he'd been diagnosed on that first x-ray, there's a very good chance he'd still be alive today. These are serious things that we're dealing with, you know. Okay, when a complication occurs, you gotta be honest and tell the truth. And you spend more time with the patient. The timing is important. And it's all right to say you're sorry. If you saw a patient walking down the hall and they slipped and fell, you go over and pick them up and say, I'm really sorry you fell. Well, it's no different. Just because you say you're sorry doesn't mean you're admitting any guilt. You have to get that mindset out. It's got to do it. You've always got to talk to families. I have a great story about uh, Dr. Art um, oh God, I can't Bond. He's a neurosurgeon here in uh, Nashville, and he's dead now. He got uh, carcinoma of the colon. But he had a patient in the hospital in the neurointensive care unit, and every morning he'd walk out, the whole family, you know, in Tennessee, when somebody, particularly a mother or father, gets in the hospital, the whole family comes. And so he'd have to stop and talk to the husband, and he'd stop and talk to the, you know, the, the children. And it would take him five or 10 minutes just to get away from them. So he decided a way to deal with that to save time. He walked out, he said, before anybody asks me a question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you something. He said, I don't have time to talk to each and every one of you. I, I want you to know what's going on. I'm gonna be very honest with you and very straightforward but I want to talk to one person and then you can ask them all the questions. And I said, I've decided that the person I'm going to talk to is the one that's going to pay the bill. So if the one that's going to pay the bill will come forward, I will talk to him. Well, everybody parted like the Red Sea. And at the very end of the hall was this little guy, farmer. He raised his hand and said, I'll pay the bill. So <laughs> Dr. Bond talked to him. It's very important. You've got to talk to families. And you've got to maintain contact with them. Now, this is very important. <laughs> and this actually happened here at Vanderbilt. So you need to know the data set when you're dealing with patients. All right. An elderly man with atrial fibrillation was admitted with an infection handwritten orders for Roceptin and Coumadin, okay? Now, this is why I like typed orders, but sometimes you have to write these in. Okay, 
this, this is the way it was written on the chart, this actual photograph of the chart. It says rosetin, one gram IV, Q12. Coumadin, 2.1 milligrams PO daily, okay? The problem is the nurse read that as one because of the squiggly line coming down, one. So it's 12.5 milligrams of Coumadin. That's 10 times the dose that the man was supposed to receive. Okay, the next morning, the patient suffered a massive stroke, okay? Doctor makes rounds at 6 a.m., is notified of the stroke and the error. At 6 a.m., the family wants to know what happened to dad, all right? So here's the doctor. He's faced with the family. His patient's had a stroke, and he has um, some possibilities of how he's gonna deal with this. These are possible scenarios. He can have no disclosure and just simply say, I don't know. I have no idea what happened to your father. Or he could say, partial disclosure. Your dad had a stroke, may have been caused by a medication error. Or could be substantial disclosure. Your father received too much Coumadin actually 10 times the dose that I meant for him to have. Or complete disclosure, the nurse misread my handwriting and gave your father 10 times the dose of Coumadin, which caused him to stroke. Okay, now it's 6 a.m. in the morning. The doctor doesn't have a full data, a full data set. In other words, he really doesn't know what happened. He really doesn't know exactly what happened. He knows that there's been an error. He knows the patient has had too much. But what does he tell the family? Well, if he's smart, he'll say something like this. Well, it appears that your father has had a stroke. The exact cause of that stroke is not known yet. We're delving into that, and as soon as I know, I will definitely make sure that you know. Well, it turned out that the man had a hemorrhagic, not a hemorrhagic, but a um, clotting problem. And that's what caused his stroke. It wasn't because he had too much Coumadin, it was because he had a thrombosis. So, the doctor should never try to explain away something unless he has a full data set. He has to know exactly what happened. So you've got to tell the patient, I don't know exactly what happened at this point, but we're investigating, and as soon as I know, I guarantee you that you will know. Now, it's called the practice of medicine for a reason. You've got to practice the art rather than the motions. It's a good idea, particularly for younger physicians, to learn from older, wiser, experienced physicians. Study and learn about customer service. There are a lot of books on customer service. There are all kinds of things on the internet about customer service. You have to remember that your patient is a customer and the customer is always right. Good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. That's a quote you ought to remember. So, in summary, the art of medicine means placing the patient's interest above all others, above yours, the hospital, the insurance company, whatever. Keep the patient fully informed, answer their questions, and allay their fears. You've got to create a friend. Give the patient your time, attention, and touch, respectively touch them. Take enough time to listen, communicate, and invite questions. Use a sense of humor. Learn to delegate and to spend your time well. Spend the most time with a patient who's had a complication. Learn how to apologize. It's okay to say you're sorry. It doesn't mean that it's your fault. 
you've got to manage your time efficiently. Now, just remember, in this day and age, everybody's rushed, everybody's behind, reimbursement is lower than it used to be, you're dealing with the government, you're dealing with the insurance companies, and you know, sometimes the patient receives the brunt of all that. You just have to keep in the back of your mind, the patient is not the enemy. I think you know who the enemy is. Take out your anger and frustration on the insurance company and not the patient, okay? We've all dealt with insurance companies. I have a real thing about the private health insurance company. And this is one of the things I have against them. To help you focus your anger against the insurance company and not the patient, consider this. In 2004 or 5, United Healthcare paid its CEO $125 million salary for one year. They gave him $1.1 billion worth of illegal backdated options. Okay? United Healthcare is based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They have such a bad reputation at that state that they cannot write a policy in the state in which they have their home office. That's a lot of money for 12 months of work. And yet, the insurance company won't, you know, take anybody that's got a pre-existing condition. They cherry-pick the patients. They won't do studies on them that need to be done. So if you're going to get mad at somebody, get mad at the insurance companies, not the patient. So I hope you've learned a little bit about the art of medicine. It's a very important thing. It's the basis of the patient-doctor relationship. And it's been going on since um, Socrates. Very important. So this contact information with Dr. Krause and myself, and glad to answer any questions. Thank you.